Hey, and welcome to this week's coaching video for those of you who are going to be teaching on Sunday morning, November the 30th at Dayspring. If you're going to be leading an adult small group on Sunday morning, November the 30th, then this video is designed to help you prepare for that lesson that you're going to teach. So go ahead and grab the transcript that you've been provided for the November 30th lesson. I'm going to read along through some of it with you and maybe give you some uh, things to think about as you get ready to prepare to teach that lesson this Sunday. So go ahead and grab that and let's look at it together, starting on page one. Now, page one is your lesson overview. It just tells you the text you're going to be teaching and the main point. Let me let me speak a little bit about this lesson before we get into the details of your transcript, because this lesson is going to complement the, the sermon from Sunday, as it always does. And, and here's what we're going to be talking about on Sunday. You know the mission of the church. We talk a lot about it here at Dayspring because it's really important. And the mission of the church is not a mission that we define for ourselves. It's a derived mission that's been handed off to us. In fact, our mission is the very mission of God himself, the Missio Dei, the mission of God. God has been on mission since the beginning of time and even before that, and now he has handed off to his church a responsibility. Now, when we talk about the mission here at Dayspring, you know, we couch it in terms of every man, woman, and child. That's what we talk about. The mission of the church being to give every man, woman, and child repeated opportunities to hear and see the gospel. Because obviously we want every man, woman, and child to have the opportunity to respond to the gospel. Now that's the mission of the church. And it's really, really important. So we focus on that a lot here at Dayspring. We talk about it. It's on the front of our bulletins, all of those things. Now, here's what can happen sometimes, and I see this happening not just in the lives of other people. I see it happening in my own heart sometimes. Sometimes the, the, the mission itself becomes not just the focus of what we're doing, but it becomes the only focus in the sense that it's not just the car that we're driving, but it's even the fuel of the car that we're driving. We're, we're trying to fuel the mission with a love for the mission itself. Now, we need to love the mission. We need to be committed to the mission and all of those things. But here's the, here's the deal. There is something else that has to fuel it. I, my participation in the mission has to be fueled by something other than my understanding of how important the mission is. So we're going to talk about that in this lesson because the, the mission itself, engagement in the mission, has to be fueled by not a love for the mission, but a love for God. Loving God and, and an awareness of the, the great salvation that's come to us and a gratitude for that salvation. I mean, Jesus said that having your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that's what you really ought to be celebrating. The great salvation that has come to us should fuel our participation in the mission. But sometimes we get so focused on the mission, we recognize how important it is that we become mission-centric more than we become God-centric. Now, we'll talk about that uh, in, this, in this lesson because here's where the lesson's going to go. It's going to complement all of this because in this lesson, what we're going to see is a passage of Scripture where the Apostle Paul, he says, listen, this heart of gratitude, this is what's going to fuel your participation in the mission. And here's what we're going to learn in this lesson, that a heart of gratitude is not dependent upon a certain uh, set of circumstances. So this is good news. I don't have to have certain circumstances happening in my life before I can be grateful for my salvation and therefore participating in the mission. I can do what God has called me to do in any circumstance. God has given me the power and the ability to do that through His Spirit, which now lives inside of me. So that's what this lesson is all about. So let's look at the details of what you're going to be teaching, starting on page 2. And this is an introduction to the lesson. Now... I want you to pay attention to the teaching tip that you have alongside uh, your, your transcript on page two. The teaching tip basically tells you to use this introductory uh, illustration or not. Um, and this is something you ought to be doing every week. You know, in this one it says, here's an illustration from a C.S. Lewis book. Now, this illustration may resonate with you or it may not. It may resonate with the people you teach or it may not. No one knows that better than you do. So it, whether it's this lesson or any lesson, contextualize your lesson. Maybe there's a better lead-in, but, but here's what this lead-in is all about. It's simply a lead-in to your passage from Philippians 4 because uh, it's kind of funny. There's a character in, in one of C.S. Lewis's uh, writings named Puddleglum, and Puddleglum is basically this guy where you're kind of saying, is his, 
is his glass, glass half full or half empty? Because quite frankly, I can't tell. When he says something positive, I mean, he, he still, you kind of hear this, what seems to be a negative spin on it. The whole point of this illustration is to say, you know, we're going to read something today, the Apostle Paul said, where you're saying, I think his glass is half full, I think, or was it half empty? I mean, that's really the whole point of the lead-in. If that resonates with you, if it works, use it. If I were teaching, I would use it because that would make sense to me. I would be able to, you know, kind of make that connection. If you can't, you've got some other options on your teaching uh, transcript there in that, in that uh, teaching tip. Now, on to the lesson. Let's say you used that opening illustration or you didn't, but now you get into the actual part of the Bible that you're going to be teaching. We're on page three of your transcript now. You're going to be teaching Philippians chapter four, verses 10 through 13. And in this section, the Apostle Paul, he kind of does a little bit of a puddle glum, you know, move here because he's saying something positive. But when you and I read it, it sounds almost like he's dogging out the Philippian church, all right? And, uh, but he's not being negative. He's being positive. In fact, you're encouraged, again, your teaching tip on page three, it encourages you to go back and read the entirety of this chapter because what you'll find pretty, pretty easily, you'll find that Paul's not being negative. He's being positive. He's saying that he's got a grateful heart. He's got a thankful heart that there are things that he's focused his mind on. That, that gives him this good spirit of gratitude, and now he's just carrying on. So he's not being all negative. He's not dogging out the Philippians. It sounds like he is, because what he says is this, and, and you'll see this when you read the text. Basically, he says, you know, I had asked for a gift from you earlier, and apparently you couldn't send it, you know, to me when I needed it. But you've eventually gotten around to doing it, and I'm grateful that you... He basically says, I'm grateful that you didn't give it to me when I needed it. Because he goes on to say, because I've learned some important things through that process. So it, his glass is full. It's half full. It sounds half empty, all right, but it's not. Now, here are two things that we're going to learn. you got two points in this lesson. The first one is this. You see it on page three, that our attitude shouldn't be dependent upon external factors. And remember, we're talking about having a grateful attitude, uh, an attitude of, of gratitude, because that's necessary to participate in the mission of God. And in fact, it's going to fuel our participation in the mission of God. What we're learning here from Paul is that that attitude of gratefulness isn't dependent upon whether things are prosperous or not prosperous, whether they're good or bad. That God gives us the ability to have the right kind of attitude and perspective even when we, as Paul is saying, even when we're not getting the gift that we thought that we would be getting, is what he was saying in, in his context. So again, Paul's saying, I really needed this back then. You didn't send it. I see now that you're getting around to sending it. But let me tell you, I'm grateful it's worked out as it has because I have learned to be content in any circumstance. So that's the point here. You move on to page four. Um, it's going to elaborate on this point for you. But look at the first full paragraph at the uh, top of page four, where it says that Paul wasn't being sarcastic. Look at that. It says he wasn't being sarcastic. He wanted them to know something important. Paul had learned that in plenty or in poverty, God would provide the kind of contentment needed for the journey of the mission of God. And this is the point. Paul's telling the, the Christians in Philippians, I'm glad things worked out like this because I've learned something very important, that I can be content, I can be grateful in all circumstances. So he's basically saying, if, you, if you're kind of fretting that you got this to me late, don't do it because I learned something very important in this process. All right. Now, um, you've got some background information that rounds out point one, some, some historical background where basically Paul um, is combating some of the stoicism of his day and some of that kind of stuff because people were pretty much in Paul's day, people were saying, well, I can be content because, uh, you know, I can kind of push this out of myself and it's self-contentment. Others were saying, when patrons make donations to me, then I can be happy. And Paul's kind of dispelling all of that. He's saying, actually, it's, my contentment's not coming from either of those sources. It has nothing to do with the circumstances. It has nothing to do whether or not I received this gift from the Philippian church. I was content when I didn't have it. Now I'm content that I do have it. I've been content in all circumstances, not dependent upon external circumstances. Now, this leads us to the second point, page four. Our attitude should only be 
dependent upon Jesus. I mean, this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of our ability to be content. Because here's what Paul has said. My contentment is not driven out of my own self. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I can bring contentment into my own life. He's saying my contentment doesn't come from outside patrons, people being good to me, people funding uh, my ministry. That's not it. Paul says, I can be content in any situation because I found my contentment in Christ alone, who is always with me, who never forsakes me. I mean, do you see what Paul's saying here? My contentment doesn't come from outside circumstances. It comes from the fact that, that God loves me and is with me. And that is never going to change. Christ is enough is what he's saying. And you know, we sing a song around here at Dayspring sometimes on Sunday mornings called Christ is Enough. You know, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in him. He is everything I need. And then the bridge of that song goes on to say, so I have decided to follow Jesus. And, and you even hear in the song that we sing, we're saying because of Christ, because of who Christ is, because of who he is, because of his beauty, because of his glory and his faithfulness and his kindness and because of his love toward me and the fact that he saved me and my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, because of him, now I've decided to follow Jesus. I can participate in the mission of God. It's, it all flows from him. It doesn't flow from anything else. And this is the whole point. Um, we can live on mission and we can participate in missional activity because of Christ, not because there is a mission, not because the mission is important, not because doing the things of the mission will even give us an identity. It all has to be fueled um, out of our identity in Christ. I, I hope you're seeing the difference here, okay? Because this is what we're talking about. Page five, look at this. Page five gets you into a verse in this context that is often misused and abused where Paul comes in this context, and now he says in verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Um, the context of that verse is really clear. I can be content in poverty. I can be content in wealth. I, it doesn't matter in any of that. I can do either or through Christ who gives me strength. So on page five, it helps you teach through some of the misuse of, of that verse because listen we use it for every reason under the sun right football players um, you know they can win a game because of Christ who gives them strength forget the fact that people on the other side of the sideline have Christ with them too um, you know I can achieve my dreams because Christ gives me strength I can do anything I want because Christ gives me strength to do it and that that is not even close to what the verse is saying all right so look at your transcript um, it's not that I can do anything I want to do through Christ who gives me strength. It's I can do anything that he wants me to do. Big difference. Big difference. All right? Um, but anyway, you've got some, uh, you'll, you'll teach through that because that's part of your text. And, um, you know, bottom line, Paul is saying I can be content, uh, which is necessary for the advancement of the gospel. If I'm going to advance the gospel, then I'm going to have to have a heart of gratitude, a heart of thankfulness, a heart of contentment. Paul says, I can always have that. I can always have a heart of contentment, not because of circumstances, but because of who Christ is and his love for me and, and who I am in Christ. I can always be content, which, which will fuel my involvement in the mission. So Paul is saying, I can always be doing what I'm supposed to do. I can always do what God has called me to do, uh, whether it's with or without your monetary gift, he tells the Philippians. So don't sweat it. Don't sweat the fact you didn't send it when I asked for it because I've now learned that I can be who God wants me to be and I can do what God wants me to do with or without your gift. That's what he was saying here. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Um, so what is it that's fueling your involvement in in the mission. That's what this lesson is all about. In fact, let me point you to a YouTube clip. It's not very long. It's from a couple of pastors and teachers who I have a lot of respect for, but it's a YouTube clip. And in fact, I'll just put the um, description right here of how you can search for it. You know, just go to YouTube and type in Platt and Chan, Mission is Not Your God. 
they have a just a it's a quick two minute discussion. Platt and Chan, missions mission is not your God, right there. Um, they talk a little bit about this, about how some good things involved in ministry or church life sometimes can become the ultimate thing. And and we can do this with mission. We can make mission the thing that it's all about. We can forget that it's actually about the God of the mission. And our love for him should fuel our participation in the mission. So that's what this lesson is all about and uh, and how circumstances kind of play into that and how good or bad circumstances don't derail our ability to do what God has called us to do. All right, after that, on page six in your transcript and page eight, you've got your application moment and then the group handout that you distribute, which is when your group will learn some of the most important things that they're going to learn. So be sure to pass those out. Be sure to participate. And then, of course, on page seven, you've got your conclusion to the lesson. It's short. It's sweet. It gets to the point, and it leads you up to uh, this week's memory verse. All right? And this week's memory verse here it is. Just let me read it to you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples after they've gone out and done some really cool stuff in his name. They're celebrating what they've done. They're celebrating what they've done. And Jesus says in Luke 10, verse 20, he says, actually, you need to rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's what you need to be rejoicing about. Not the mission, not your involvement in the mission, not what you've accomplished in my name. Don't let that fuel your work. What you've accomplished, don't let that fuel your work. Let what Jesus has accomplished, let that fuel your work. It'll make all the difference. All right? Hey, God bless you. Thanks for listening in on this coaching video. Hope you have a, a good um, lesson this Sunday, and we'll see you then. And thank you for your love and everything you've done for me. There is no